I work with Pax Christi, which is an international Catholic movement for peace. I coordinate the work of Pax Christi here in England and Wales, and I've been doing that for about the last 26 years. And the work of Pax Christi is very broad. It relates to campaigning around issues like the arms trade, nuclear issues, ethical investments. It's also about peace education, the work we do in schools with young people, adult formation. It's also about trying to root the way we look at issues of peacemaking in our lives and in our faith and putting faith into action. So it has a kind of three-pronged approach. And what I'm going to focus on this morning is a very unique gathering that happened in Rome earlier this year. And I want to share some of the good news of that and some of the outcomes that relate to what we might be doing in January when it comes to the Peace Sunday opportunity. But first of all, I'd like us to imagine things for a little bit. Imagine. Pope Francis is doing amazing things and he's just issued an encyclical on non-violence and just <coughs> peacemaking. Have you seen it? No. <laughs> We're not quite there. I did a bit of doctoring of Laudato. <laughs> but we are getting there. We are en route to working with Pope Francis, with the Pontifical Council, on an encyclical on non-violence and just peacemaking. Imagine... Do you have a supposed date when that might emerge? <laughs> no. I'll come back to that. 100 years? <laughs> no, 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 no. Imagine that our key Fallon and... I get them muddled up. That's Fallon and that's Hammond. There's been a major rethink in budgets globally and the billions that we spend on defence each year and the 40 billion we spend on defence in this country has been reallocated and it's been reallocated into rethinking what security is about and how we build peace. And part of that money is going to preventing violence and conflict. So we have a, a ban on nuclear weapons. This country has legally been stopped from selling arms to Saudi Arabia and on and on. We've eradicated social injustice. We've got to the roots of poverty, whether it's here at home or internationally. We've invested in non-violent, unarmed peacemaking training people around the world to be present and to accompany those who are living on the edge of violence and who accompany them through that and prevent violence from escalating. <clears throat> We've invested in trauma healing projects, both in our own communities but globally, so that the fear that's left behind, the trauma that's left behind from war and conflict and violence <clears throat> doesn't paralyse communities and allow violence to be repeated and carried on from one generation to another. Imagine that. It's possible. We can reallocate budgets. We can reallocate priorities. Imagine our seminaries and our teacher training institutions and our pastoral training and the development of catechetical training includes at its heart training on conflict transformation. It looks at how we can weave issues of peacemaking, reconciliation into the way we approach our sacramental preparation so that life experience and sacramental values are brought together the gospel non-violence of Jesus is central to the way in which we form ourselves in our institutions. And we allow the lives of contemporary peacemakers to be models, to set values and pathways for how we go about our education programmes. We're not afraid to look at the non-violent Jesus and the courageous non-violence of challenging the status quo and the way things are always done. 
We're not afraid of following the non-violent Jesus and breaking laws and challenging norms when they destroy or diminish people. We're not afraid of absorbing, willingly absorbing violence rather than passing it on to others. That's all possible. Core formation on these core values of peacemaking and non-violence. There are things that are not quite have been achieved yet, but as I said, they are all possible. And in a way, they help to set the drive <coughs> and the motivation for this conference that took place in Rome in April of this year, that we in Pax Christi International were central in bringing it about, working with the Pontifical Council of Justice and Peace in Rome. It took us about two years to get this thing off the ground. And it's a core group of us, myself from Pax Christi in this country and some from our international team, members of the Pontifical Council, in particular two religious who work in there, some mission orders, Mary Noel Global Mission, the Columban missionaries, and together we crafted, we spent 18 months crafting an idea, <coughs> a process, fundraising, because we wanted to get off the ground and take to the heart of the church this idea of how we could work together to move the church towards a commitment to non-violence and to just peacemaking. What were we about? Well, I think the heart of it was very well summed up by our international co-president in Pax Christi. How do we not allow a situation in the world where the assumption continues that when there is violence or potential violence, the only answer is to drop more bombs or to have more military or more police or more coercion, whatever it might be in each context. How do we generate creative thinking so that the experience of active, effective non-violence can begin to move the possibilities and thinking? That was really kind of underpinning what we were trying to do. In order to kind of really try and reflect the global experience, we had to be very careful in trying to think who were we going to invite to this conference. We obviously had a core team from the Pontifical Council who were going to be with us all the time. So we very carefully looked through our networks around the kind of global community and carefully identified 80 participants from 35 countries who reflected academic approaches, pastoral approaches, activists in peacemaking, uh, members of religious congregations, the whole kind of, ex kind of lived experience of trying to make things happen and bring them together for our conference. A real fusion of practice, theology, academic, all coming together to help us grapple with this issue. Right from the heart, the start, we were very clear that we wanted Rome, and when I say Rome, I mean Pope Francis and I mean the <coughs> Council, to be with us, to be on board. And while Pope Francis couldn't actually come to our conference, he sent a message right at the beginning via Cardinal Turkson, uh, where he said, in order to see solutions to the unique and terrible world war in instalments, how we look at the world, Humanity needs to refurbish all the available tools to help women and men fulfil their aspirations for justice and peace. That was part of his presentation to us when we gathered at the beginning. And he went on to say that we, those of us who were gathered, had to revitalise the tools of non-violence and active non-violence in particular. So we were very encouraged that this challenge was coming from Francis. We had Cardinal Turkson with us, I think, for the whole of our three-day gathering, just as an ordinary participant. And we were very encouraged to have him very much on side. I think it's also important the process we used. We didn't want a top-down academic process. 
So we used a very kind of participatory process of cluster presentations with key resource people, uh, with a kind of fishbowl um, environment where four people started a conversation around a theme, but then others could come and join that conversation. And to, uh, to us, again, that was very important. The way we go about doing our work the processes that we use reflect something about what we're trying to achieve. That kind of interaction between people. So the core themes that we looked at uh, that form the kind of the two-day program uh, drawing on experiences of non-violence in practice. So we had people from Sudan and Sri Lanka and Iraq and Uganda and Afghanistan sharing with us their work for non-violence in their contexts. We had people helping reflect on the non-violence of Jesus from taking us back to first century Palestine and what that would have meant, Jesus's witness and life in first century Palestine to what it means for us today in 21st century world. We had inputs of reflection on non-violence and just peace, and I'll come back to the just peace element in a little while. And we had sessions on how do we move <coughs> from unending war, that request that came from Marie Dennis, this assumption that the way we solve problems is through military means. They formed the four kind of core themes of our actual conference. It was very important that we started with this, experiences of non-violence in places of violence, because we realised that we, we had to face the realities of violence. We couldn't have a kind of cosy approach to non-violence. We had to root it, and we rooted it with people like Sister Nazek, a Dominican sister who is from um, Iraq, currently living in Erbil. In Erbil and her experience, like that of many thousands, she's had to move home four or five times, um, her community had been threatened, some of them have lost their lives, and she presented to us, she drew for us the sign that ISIS used, that they put on the doors of Christians uh, to isolate and to highlight where <coughs> members of the Christian community live, so that they could become easy targets. And she drew around that herself, the, the thorn, the sense of Christians who are experiencing uh, violence because they are Christians in these contexts. But she didn't play on that. Uh, she went on to say how when she had told her community she was coming to this conference that she'd been invited, they said to her, why are you bothering? The violence is too great. It's not worth it. What have we got to do with a conference on non-violence? And then she said she spoke to her family about it. And they said, no, you must go. Because we're talking about long-term solutions here in Iraq. We're not just talking about the moment. You must go and participate. And she spoke to us very clearly about the idea that in her own community, they had come, some of them not willingly, but they'd come to the conclusion that their role is to try and engage with ISIS, with those who are threatening them. Because she said, you look around, and who are ISIS? They're the young men, for the most part, who within the Iraq context have known nothing but years of sanctions, <coughs> occupation, <coughs> militarization, <coughs> and they feel abandoned by everything that's happened to them. And if we're not engaging with them, if we're not in conversation with them, then nothing is going to change. We also had with us someone who some of you may know, uh, Father Francisco Larue, the Jesuit from Colombia. He too has been involved in peacemaking in Colombia in the peace process for more than 20 years, living in very violent communities. He was on a speaking tour here last year. And he spoke again about the need to get your hands dirty in your work for non-violence. How they go into communities that have been devastated by violence, 
to be with those communities, but that they then go to the communities, the guerrillas or the paramilitary who've committed that violence, and they confront them. And they say, what you've done is terrible, but we have to engage with you. We have to talk with you. We have to bring you to see what's happening here in this situation. And he talked about that very fine line, which has caused some problems in making the peace process stick. That line of engaging each party in the conflict in some kind of process that will lead to long-term stable change, which is what they're seeking. And these are just some of the words of some of the, you know, the, the ways in which people perceive what they're doing. They're perceived with suspicion by some. They're threatened with execution by others. But they're trying to communicate this understanding of Christian peacemaking with the model of Jesus. Uh, they're trying to keep an agenda of peace going with each community, demonstrate by the way they go about their peace work what it is they're seeking and take risks in the process. What I found most interesting about one of the things that uh, he shared with us was that one of his main hopes for the conference would be that the Catholic Church abandon its kind of dependence on just war principles. And the reason he said that was because in the context of uh, Colombia, he said many people have looked over the years at people joining guerrilla groups, people going into the mountains and fighting for freedom, and they put that down to liberation theology. It's driving people to violence. He said that's not true. What's driving people to violence in Colombia and elsewhere is the just war tradition. Because we see our military being blessed by our bishops. And we see our paramilitary going and praying at statues of Mary before they go to fight. He said it's that justification of war and violence by the official church that is the problem. It's not an analysis of poverty and injustice that comes through liberation theology. So their stories were very, very powerful in underpinning and creating a kind of agenda for what we were about. And we also wanted, as I said, to root what we were doing, both in the kind of non-violence of Jesus, the courage of active non-violence, and we've seen that expressed in our world in other times by other faith traditions as well as our own, people following that non-violent path of Jesus, putting it into practice, challenging, breaking rules, breaking laws, uh, taking risks upon ourselves. And we saw that in flesh by many of those who were with us at the conference. We were also inspired by many existing groups that are working on the ground for non-violence. Groups that are about creating civilian peacemakers, non-violent peace teams, uh, peaceful accompaniment through organisations like Nonviolent Peace Force, uh, which is present in about 20 countries around the world, training local people in nonviolent conflict prevention, conflict uh, transformation, accompanying people in times of violence. Christian peacemaker teams who are working in Colombia and Palestine and elsewhere, uh, in areas where uh, tensions run high, where there needs to be some kind of witness. Uh, the ecumenical accompaniment program that we support, the work in Israel and Palestine of volunteers who train and go and live and work in communities to witness, to be beside them, to take evidence, to monitor what's happening. There are something like 12 global NGOs working on non-violent peacemaking. And yet they get, very, they get probably no government support. They're all funded by kind of grassroots initiatives. But they are essential in trying to form new patterns of presence, engagement, facing violence, accompanying people, working through issues of trauma, trying to create new models of justice on the ground, essential if peace is to be 
built and sustained. We also talked about just peace principles. Uh, a lot of work has been done by theologians and peace practitioners to say, yeah, non-violence, great idea, but what are the steps, what are the things that have to happen on the ground to make it happen? And just as we've had a just war set of principles or guidelines, we need the same if we're talking about just peace building. And some of the qualities and characteristics of just peace building, it has to be about protecting, defending and restoring relationships. That has to be a key criteria for engagement. It has to be about creating positive peace. And by positive peace, we mean that the outcome, the end result, has to be sustainable, has to be owned by communities. Too often, the negative peace we have through war, through conflict, is containment. It's not owned by people. And in a year or two years' time, we're back into that cycle again. It has to be participatory. Uh, people have to be involved in creating their own peace processes. We have to draw on local traditions, especially in the Global South. There are many traditions built into cultures and communities that contribute to the whole process of peace and reconciliation. We have to restore relationships. Um, the whole issue of um, things that we've seen in recent years through tribunals and through truth and reconciliation commissions Processes that allow those who've been involved or victims of violence to be part of some dialogue and uh, to have their stories respected and told and used as part of a process for healing and moving forward. Uh, it has to be about reconciliation, but this is an outcome, it's not a beginning, this is an outcome. Uh, it has to be about restoring uh, relationships and people. Uh, this is where the trauma healing and looking at that bottom-up restoration of communities and confidence building comes. And it has to be about sustainability, uh, putting processes in place. The painstaking work that happens when a war ends. The painstaking work that they're going to have to do in Colombia now to make that peace process happen. The painstaking work that has to happen now in Israel and Palestine so that whatever might be achieved, you know, five or six years down the line, when we have some kind of resolution, it won't go to pot, it won't go to hell, because we've put systems in place to manage and build it. So, you know, being very canny and practical about what peace building is about. Right, back to the conference. When we all went back to our homes at the end of April last year, there was a great flurry of press coverage. National press, international press, church press gathered, you know, stories about this conference. There were press conferences, it was very encouraging for the most part. There was a lot of negative press about this gathering as well. Uh, what happens when you replace just war with a just peace? Uh, the press in this country, the tablet, the Catholic Herald, were very negative about the whole thing. And it was very disheartening, uh, especially as they weren't there. They didn't bother to find out exactly what had happened. They honed in on one sentence in the whole appeal. They didn't bother to ask those of us who were there. Uh, so this highlights a problem, that we sometimes don't do ourselves any favors because we, we reduce our understanding or the way we talk about things without really elaborating. So I think to talk about non-violence without talking about non-violence in action, because we have to give it a life and a dynamic and a color and a shape to see what it means. Uh, to talk about just war and completely dismiss it and not recognise that it has actually informed the way international law and rules of war and engagement have, sh have been shaped is crazy. But we want to move beyond that because we don't want to be limited 
by military solutions and the way that they suck resources away from more creative, sustainable ways of achieving and bringing peace about. Um, so, we made a call to the church. And our call to the church is in the form of an appeal, which I have copies of here. And these are some of the elements that we continue developing Catholic social teaching. And I said the idea of an encyclical is down the line. We're getting there. Uh, it's likely that some of us may be going back to Rome in December to have more meetings with the Pontifical Council, uh, with some others as well. Uh, and already we have shaped an outline of key strands that could form the basis of an encyclical. But I think we're talking at least one year, two years down the line. These things take a long time. Uh, integrating gospel non-violence into, as I said, our formation, seminaries, education. Looking at practices and strategies of non-violence. There is so much around, there are so many tools available uh, that we can share. Uh, looking, trying to initiate global conversations. Um, and by this we mean advocacy, international politics, better use of uh, foreign policies that incorporate some of these just peace approaches. Uh, and the idea that we no longer use just war theory <coughs> as the first point of contact when we're looking at global conflict or global difficulties. The first step, we were delighted the first thing we asked, the first outcome we asked for, was would it be possible that the World Peace Message <coughs> in January 27 was on non-violence? And Francis accepted that. So we have the World Peace Message, non-violence is a style of politics for peace. And I think that's very clever. Because it roots non-violence in the real world. It roots non-violence in all the practical possibilities and steps that need to be taken politically, 